Okay. And the, the ice is so thick that you really have these big trucks full of um, uh, coal, you know, mm -hmm. so very heavy trucks who travel on the ice. Yeah. Yeah. But in summer, it's, it's this, well, it's still the river, but then with small boats, yeah. It's a river, yeah. It's, yeah, it's something. Yeah. Like some distances are so big. And like my question was like, they went up north to hunt for the reindeer and the river I looked at, in, at, up at the map was like very, very close to their, the Arctic Ocean mm -hmm. that they yeah. said, Chun Chun, well, whatever, Chun Chun. Yeah. 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 So it's a long distance. So where did they come from? Like what, I understand it's a fiction, but <laughs> just, <laughs> Like, how long did they actually travel to that uh, hunting place? Uh, where they saw the reindeer? Um, I think we, we traveled the full day. The full day on the boat. On the boat, and then that's, that's when we were... Hello, uh, my name is Christoph Mauch and I'm the director of the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society here in Munich at Ludwig Maximilians University. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you for a discussion of uh, what I think is a marvelous film, Holgut, that was just uh, released uh, by its director, Lisbeth de Koehler from Brussels. And we're lucky to have a group of panelists very unique group of panelists, unique in, in many ways. First of all, because they are there's something you can't see. Uh, they are in very different places right now. One of them 
uh, Lisbeth herself is in Brussels. Uh, Olga Trunkanova is in Beijing, where it's 2 a.m. at night. And uh, Elena uh, Fetchkina uh, Tracy is in Ottawa. Uh, and uh, here in the studio, actually, which is a theater, there's Jan Sebening, one of the organizers of DocFest, and he is my co moderator. So you have a chance to ask questions through the chat, and he will be involved in that as well. So after about half an hour, uh, we will open the discussion to people beyond our little podium. Uh, let me just say a few things. Lisbeth uh, de Coilier is has produced a number of films. The first one was about uh, Redwood Forest the, uh, uh, in, in North America. The second one was also about North America. It was a film about Victoria. Well, that's, uh, Victoria doesn't exist as such, but a city in the desert in California. And this is her third film. It seems to me that what brings them together is uh, sort of a pioneering spirit, a frontier, the horizon. Uh, she's somebody who comes from uh, a city and uh, from Belgium. And uh, perhaps in Belgium, like in Germany, people are intrigued by uh, uh, American culture. And uh, this is uh, one of the things that seems to be a theme of her. Uh, th uh, the, the frontier, uh, being in an empty landscape while you live in an urbanized country, but also uh, fascination with forests. So her first um, film is about forests. Elena uh, Fetichkina Tracy uh, is also fascinated, if not obsessed, with forests. She did her doctorate in uh, about forestry in many different continents. She worked for the World Wildlife Fund in Russia. She comes from Siberia, left Siberia at the age of 25. But when I talked to her a couple of days ago, I asked her, where are you now? She said, I'm in Ottawa, but I never really left Siberia. She has been uh, in Siberia also as a journalist. She's a journalist, activist, scientist. And uh, she uh, did a film, actually, she did three films in 2005 about uh, another part of Siberia. So she brings a lot of knowledge and an interesting perspective to this discussion. And Olga Truganova is uh, mentored by one of the members of the Rachel Carson Center, uh, Julia Herzberg. And uh, she is, it says in the announcement, at the University of Regensburg. But she just told me she's never been to Regensburg. Yet she is in Beijing. And I, I can't thank you enough for being with us, Olga, today. Uh, Olga is actually uh, originally a, a historian. She uh, comes also from Siberia. So we've got two uh, Siberian uh, uh, well, uh, natives that come from different parts of Siberia. Uh, Olga actually comes from uh, Novosibirsk. And uh, Olga is, um, uh, um, went to St. Petersburg, if I remember correctly, when she was 18 years old, studied history there, was interested in, in memory cultures, and then moved to Germany, uh, to Berlin, and uh, studied art history, got a second master, and now she's working on Siberian food history, has been working on that for a couple of years as a doctoral student. So we've got historian, art historian, activist, scientist, and a film uh, director, and I, I'm so pleased to uh, welcome you here. Uh, let me ask uh, one after the other, maybe I ask Elena first, uh, because I'm really intrigued. You both come from Siberia, but you come from different parts of Siberia. So maybe uh, I could ask you uh, what this film does to you emotionally. What is your reaction? What do you like about it? So should I, should I answer first? Uh, yeah, I think Elena, yeah, Olga seems to be happy with it. And, uh, and uh, uh, Lisbeth is eager to hear your opinion and your reaction, your rather spontaneous reaction. Oh, OK. Um, well, if, if you don't mind, I will just spend a little bit of time going through my emotions, like detailing them and uh, trying to unfold them. I think there's so many good, uh, fascinating things about this film, so I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about it. So first of all, it brings a lot of personal memories for me, actually, as a child who grew up in the Soviet Union. Um, as one of the protagonists in this film, a scientist, Simeon, I was also exposed to this kind of scientific Soviet discourse about the mammoth. Not only the cartoons, but there was lots of science done at the time. Uh, as a child, when I was nine years old, we were taken with a group of children from Eastern Siberia on a, on a trip to St. Petersburg, where we actually went to a museum of zoology. And we saw this famous 
The most famous baby mammoth in the Soviet Union was the mammoth Dima, Mamantyonok Dima. And it was in that museum and we saw it was very intact little mammoth. And the story behind was that, okay, maybe one day they will somehow bring them, him back to life because he's look, looking so intact. So I clearly remember about this mammoth story and it just stayed with me. Um, I also, very emotionally <laughs> speaking, um, but this film is really having, um, you know, it has a stunning cinematography, you know, like imagery, soundtrack, you know, the, the pace of the film, the characters, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, the genre of the whole good is defined as a hybrid. Uh, it combines the elements of fiction and documentary, right? So for me, this genre works really well. It's a new genre for me. I think it's a very delicate balance there is a deliberate storyline, but also some, you know, raw unmediated moments of, of, of that reality, you know, so I really like that. Um, I think that the, uh, for me, at least how I see it, the central theme of this uh, film is about the wilderness. Um, this place is, in, is existing somewhere at the edge of the world, Siberian perma, permafrost in this case, and people going on a special quest or a journey, and they traveling through those uh, unique landscapes. So, so the, the film actually touches upon a universal mythology uh, that is kind of shared by the whole humanity, you know? So you can find the structure of this myth practically in all traditions. Um, it's the idea of the rite of passage when a young person has to go into the wilderness to accomplish a certain task. Um, so outcome is always transformative the landscape usually plays a very important role for the personal transformation. Uh, but the film also has many other layers, right? Um, many things, many themes, and really it's, it's worth watching several times. When I watched it the second time, I, I saw things that I didn't see when I watched it the first time. So the, the first one for me is an environmental um, activist is, of course, it's climate change. So it's right there. So it's very visible the permafrost is melting. You cannot ignore it anymore. Uh, so the bones of the mammoths come from the ground. This is very surreal, but at the same time, it's very real. You see it, right? So in some ways, it's like a story from a scary um, Russian fairy tales. So scary, fascinating. The earth is revealing its ancient secrets. Um, so the mammoths went extinct a long time ago, right? But it's also a story about the modern extinction. So wild reindeer, that is also the animals of the, of the Siberian permafrost, now it's gone from its usual habitats. And so the hunter and the boy, those two other protagonists from a scientist, they cannot find large animals for hunting because the, the, the wild reindeer is gone. So the boy cannot complete his spiritual journey. He cannot complete his rite of passage, right? So, so we see in the film that the wild reindeer are moving further north like mammoths in the past and their population is rapidly declining, right? So one of the protagonists, the hunter, can no longer hunt because wild animals, most of them are, wild, are all gone. So he says that he does not even remember what he did the last year because he lost the track of time. He doesn't go hunting anymore. So he's also losing his identity because of that. So I think this film is so powerful at this particular moment in time because we can all relate to its central theme, its metamorphosis. So collectively as a humanity, we experience a very rapid change which impacts on our daily practices now, our professions and also our identity our lives are no longer the same. In some ways, we are not living the normal life anymore. You know, some of us cannot go to work or we cannot do things we usually do due to the pandemic. Many people lost their livelihoods, their incomes and their loved ones. So if we talk about the film, but also about our own experiences as viewers, you know, the pandemic has deep environmental causes as well. It's something to do with the shrinking habitats of wild animals because so diseases and viruses now can 
cross the boundaries between animals and humans. So we can really relate as viewers to the central theme of this movie. So the old myths and the old familiar rites of passages are no longer meaningful. You know, as a parent, I think about this almost every day. What, you know, what my daughter's life is going to be like in this very rapidly changing world. Um, will younger generations have enough resilience to undergo this change without much help available from the old ways of doing things? Can they build their own strength uh, and to find their own new identity and new meanings? I personally think that they can. And I believe that this film also somehow conveys this message of home. And I think it's done through the boy rather than through the sci scientist. But I think we can definitely debate this. So, uh, so I would like to maybe ask these questions later on. So what is kind of a, the main message of, of, of hope uh, for uh, Lisbeth? Well, wonderful statement and analysis. I wonder how Lisbeth uh, sees this. Uh, it seems, I mean, it, it's a film, I find it very, very suggestive. A film that doesn't uh, drive down a message. It's a film that's poetic and philosophical, and as you just mentioned, Elena, deeply human and something that we can relate to. And that, that, that's fascinating, that's so connotative. There's so many, uh, it gives, uh, I mean, you've, you've, in these few minutes that you told us what your own experience was as a kid uh, with mammoths, but also how you feel as a scientist or an activist today, it opens so many venues. And I'm wondering, Elisabeth, do you see yourself in some of these interpretations? Uh, uh, what, uh, what would your response be to Elena's uh, question? And maybe uh, perhaps even the, the question about hope, is this a film of hope? Uh, yes, for me, it's a it's a, it's a film of, of fears of my own personal fears that I think I share with a lot of people. But then also hope in the end. And I think for me, it's it's also a personal thing. And I think films should not just uh, portray an image of doom. I, I I feel like we should find hope. But then, as a filmmaker, of course. Uh, uh, where to find this hope? Uh, that's a bit that's a bit difficult, and it's true that. Um, uh, well, th thank you for this beautiful analysis of the film. Um, when 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 you make a film, you try to put a lot of things in it, and and you accept the fact that some will get uh, some elements will get unnoticed. But it's always very nice to uh, hear somebody who saw so much in the film. Thank you, um, and it's very true. Like for me, also. The project it started with um, me being fascinated about the by the idea of extinction of animal extinction, and um, the, I, I very quickly found that uh, the past hundred years, but also the thousand years, that humankind had a very big hand in it, and that as you already said um, uh, in, in your talk, that um, it's always the biggest animals. Uh, who seem to go. We, we see it in, in, in so many territories. We see it in Siberia. We see it in, 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 in Australia. We even see it when the, when the Europeans went to, um, to um, the Americas and that the, the buffaloes were still the largest animals there and they went uh, to uh, hunting competition, uh, the, the shrinking of the land. Um, uh, so I was very fascinated about this story, uh, but I didn't want to tell a story that was history, you know, I didn't want to say something about that happened because I also, I wanted us to, to think about ourselves and our own actions here and now and not something, ah, this, this, ha this, this just happened in the past. So that was one of the things that I went to look for, a story where, um, um, where extinction is in the making, actually. And um, another element that was very important for me was uh, uh, the climate change. And it's true what you said, that our, our daily lives are influenced. But of course, me living uh, in Belgium, in Brussels, we are a bit shielded uh, from these changes. Uh, so I wanted to go to a place where you could really see, uh, see the effects already to, to, to really also maybe bring it back to, to where I live and say like, okay, there, there, there are really uh, changes. Uh, so these are two 
pillars that that were separately in me, but of course they uh, they connect uh, very much. Animal extinction and climate change are, are very linked. And um, when I was doing research about these animal extinctions, of course, I came up with the I, I, uh, I found the story of the mammoth in in Siberia, the mammoth extinction, which is. Um, um, very much the theory that it's a combination of climate change and um, uh, humans having better uh, hunting techniques. Uh, that was the extinction. And then now, um, it, but again, it's not just something in the past. Now through um, uh, more heating of the, 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 the temperatures, we have the melting of the permafrost, we have these tusks uh, coming out. Um, it, there's not only this climate change, but you see people do stuff with it. They, they, they go for the tusks, uh, for the, the precious ivory there. They, um, you have scientists who try to clone or also try to study it, but also try to clone the mammoths to bring it back. And um, when I went to Siberia, one of the first times I was still, I wanted to work more with uh, tusk hunters, but um, it was actually coincidentally while I was talking to tusk hunters, I was staying with this um, with a family uh, because we went to a small village, Kazachi, um, and we were staying with a family. There's no hotel, so you have to uh, be invited. And we were talking to a lot of people. And in the meantime, we were getting acquainted with these people in the house that we were staying with. And they had nothing to do with tusk hunting or mammoths, but they, they kept uh, also because of the language barrier, a lot went through our phone. So they kept showing me pictures of the tundra and of, 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 of them uh, picking berries, going hunting, all these things. And I got totally captivated by that. And I said like, okay, I don't, I also want it to be about more than just the mammoth. I don't want to make a mammoth film. It's more about uh, extinction. So that's when I found, uh, when, by talking to them, like I found a story about uh, the reindeer and that there's no more uh, wild reindeer. So there everything uh, connected as well. Um, then to answer, um, and then, oh, the third pillar, um, that was something that was, uh, important for me is I, I was wondering, like, we, we tell our, our children stories about the past, uh, fairy tales or myths or, or, or whatever, all these stories about the past, and it takes on mythical proportions, but I wanted to look, um, at what is happening now. Now, like, what if somebody is telling the story about now to their child in 500 years or in 1000 years, how would they, it's difficult to see uh, um, what is happening at this moment. So that was uh, one of the challenges. And, and when you talk about these topics, you have extinction, you have de-extinctions, it's, it's almost like coming back from the dead. You have the earth changing, you have these, uh, these, these heroes, these, the, the, the uh, for example, the scientist who is really on a mission to, to go that. And I thought, okay, this everything has such mythical uh, proportions here. So let's take this opportunity actually to, to, to look at our current days as a myth. Uh, so those were the three pillars that I wanted. Of course, in my movie, I don't, uh, like I've said before, I am not a scientist or I'm, I'm not an expert in all these different topics. and. I, don't, I also don't think that's that's my job. What what my job is more. I, I I'm not looking for definite answers, but more um, to raise a, a conversation, to to add elements, to to go in a conversation. Um, but then the story of hope. I think it was it was difficult for me because uh, when we talk about uh, climate change, global warming, it's it's something scary for for me um, as a person. Like, well, how is my life going to be? How is the next generation going to live? So it was difficult to find hope, but I I I couldn't just make it a doom movie about it. And in through uh, cinematography, through images and sounds, I try to um, uh, get a way out. Like also the boy. Um, the movie, there's always the question being asked, um, what is our effect on animals and going extinct? But there's, there's rarely the question, but what does this animal extinction does to our lives? Because to me, it seems like we, we have holes in our stories, like what you, what you said, like these animals leave and, and how can we uh, 
become full, you know, that the, these are important elements that go away. So it was difficult for me to also find um, this hope in reality. And that's also why there was also fictionalizations for me, especially also the last part of the movie. It's like fictionalizations of, of the dreams of our, our protagonist. And for me, also the last image of the boy, it, he's, he's in the, he, he, he finds kind of a solution in, an, in maybe a bit of an artificial world, but there are still ways out. And maybe uh, his hunting of the reindeer didn't go as planned, but still he, he, he finds something else. So in this kind of way, I do try to bring a message of hope. I think this is, this is wonderful how the two of you speak to each other and uh, how both of you, uh, well, how you've just explained now, Lisbeth, uh, what you were setting out to do and how some of the things that we were setting out to do evolved in a different way and that uh, the story took on its own, uh, you know, dynamic and uh, there, was, there, was, there was an idea behind it. You wanted to see things evolve yourself. You wanted to see something, uh, what, how climate change plays out. But uh, the, the protagonists, who you didn't know in advance, uh, were co-scripting mm -hmm. the, the story and you were scripting it. So you, you, you are both uh, an artist and an ethnographer and uh, a choreograph in this, but you couldn't know in advance at all how it would evolve. At this point, I'd just like to ask Olga to tell us her reaction of somebody who, who grew up in uh, Novosibirsk, uh, which is a, a different part of Siberia, of course, uh, and uh, who, uh, who hasn't been, I think, to Yakutia. Uh, what does this film do to you, Olga? Yes, thank you. I really enjoyed watching this film and it was very educational for me as well. Although, of course, yes, I come from Siberia, but still I come from a very urban part from Novosibirsk, the third biggest city in Russia. And of course, there is only Russian spoken there. And this film really shows how vivid, how different and diverse Siberia is, how huge it is, even for a person born there. And uh, it was uh, amazing to watch a film in Yakutian language. I really liked it. Uh, that even the um, uh, the titles um, after the film, they were also written in Yakutian, which I really, really appreciated. And the music was also Yakutian, so it was really atmospheric in that sense. Um, and uh, um, speaking of the plot and of the motives, I think uh, a lot of things that you have already mentioned also fascinated me. And the first being actually this relationship between the human beings and the dead animals, which is also paradoxic that dead animals have their own agency and can influence our life nowadays, even though they are, have been uh, dead for a long time. And uh, of course, this um, uh, relation from human towards the animals is rather destructive because it is this global warming team, of course, which is very present. Extinction of animals uh, also through the global warming, but also through human hunting. Uh, and then all, all of a sudden, these dead animals come to rescue, like come to save the people. And uh, I think this film, for me, it's divided into two big parts. The first part um, about the hunting of reindeer and it's a bit desperate because they can't find them and this is what constitutes their life, right? And uh, uh, it's uh, right in the middle of this initiation process of becoming a man and a uh, um, smaller brother cannot fulfill this role uh, of becoming a male, uh, a man just because um, the environment does not allow it to happen in that way. But finally, as a happy end to the first part, he finds this mammoth trunk and uh, task, sorry. And uh, then we see the whole second part, how um, this uh, maybe task of man as a breadwinner changes from hunting the animals towards hunting dead animals. And, um, and this actually helps, right? Because I remember the phrase uh, from the first part of the film that they say, I can't return home uh, um, with um, empty hands, right? And uh, the mammoth comes here as uh, something which can still uh, be a satisfactory result of their hunting. Yeah, um, this I found really um, 
interesting on how many layers it plays, but also there are other uh, um, interplay of various layers in the film, which I found interesting. For example, the interchange between global and local. Uh, also speaking of the uh, climate change, we usually uh, we know that it's a global issue, but it's seen in certain regions of the world. And although I'm not um, environmental uh, environmental specialist or so, I'm quite interested in the subjects. But I think mainly what we uh, um, learn about is examples of these immediate effects of the climate change come from the global south. And now we see the Nordic <laughs> example of it and this um, yeah, really touching scenes of the melting permafrost that something goes really wrong and we can see it, we can touch it. Right. Um, another uh, opposition which I found interesting was uh, um, traditionalism and modernity, uh, which is also maybe uh, the relationship between the Yakutian culture or also some elements of, of, of Russia, Russian culture, Russian words which they use for the words which maybe cannot be otherwise uh, explained in a, in a Yakutian language or there is a scene where they uh, are sitting uh, all together after the hunt, right, in the first part of the film and you can see the some Fanta drink staying on the table, or there is this military uniform with a Russian flag on the sleeve, and it's all right because it's how how it is, and uh, this is also very authentic. And this mixture of cultures of temporalities, it's uh, just um, yeah the way the way it is, which I found quite um, honest in that in this film. Um, right. Wonderful. Uh, I'm just realizing while we are talking that uh, there are three female panelists discussing a film that has only male protagonists. And uh, I, I'm wondering, maybe Lisbeth, you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, there, what uh, was that a deliberate decision to only have um, male protagonists? Um, well, um to only have male protagonists was not a deliberate decision, but it's a, it's rather a, a consequence of um, um, of my time there also being limited, and also to have uh, I had a I, it's like you said I didn't Semyon I met many years ago and we had time to email and to talk about the film, but these two brothers I didn't meet in advance also because my time was was so limited I had been to Kazachi and I met um, this family in, in whose house we stayed. And um, I worked together with uh, the man of that family. He, he was very fascinated by what we were doing. And we found out that he had had a, an education in a film in St. Petersburg when he was a young man. And so I had a very good connection with him. And I said like, okay, can we work together? He, normally, he, he's a fisherman. He doesn't he doesn't have anything to do with film. But I knew that he had a sense of sensitivity and that he understood what we were doing. So um, when I left and during that trip, I, I hadn't met Roman or Kim yet, and um, it was because I had such a good understanding. And when I was back in Brussels, uh, we would uh, be communicating through WhatsApp. Uh, so there was, um, with uh, Google Translate as well, so there was a communication, but it was very minimal, but it was because this first encounter was so well. And um, so when I uh, got back to Brussels, well, there, of course, there was a lot of time that go over it. We found the story of, of the, the reindeer, and then he found, uh, this, this man, he found uh, uh, Roman and Kem. Uh, when I went there, we started working. So. I think that if I would have had much more time, if I would have been Yakutian or, or lived there, I think it would have been possible. But I had set up this story of extinction, of climate change, and there wasn't the the, the freedom to or the time to, to really look for maybe, let's say, a girl who's been taken. I mean, I would have found that interesting, but that would have been very difficult. Also there, uh, women, uh, are not allowed to go fishing or hunting, for example. Uh, so uh, the fact that I could join was actually a very big privilege. They looked at me as, it was never a problem, but they looked at me as a professional. 
uh, as a filmmaker. That's what I was doing there. So I could join, but normally women are, are not allowed. I think also when we, uh, when I was with some young scientists and we, we encountered these uh, um, uh, task hunters who go into the wilderness for a couple of months for the, during the summer months, I don't think they had seen a, a woman in a very long time. But it, for me, it was never a problem. They understood the, 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 the goal. Um, as a woman, well, it's a choice I had to make. If I wanted to make this movie, if I wanted to tell the story about uh, extinction, de-extinction, climate change, then that was the way it had to be. And it's, yeah. it's more a consequence yeah. than that it's a deliberate choice. Yeah. Uh, Maybe Olga has, a, I gave uh, uh, Elena a chance to ask a question. Maybe Olga has a question too. I would also like you to uh, maybe tell us a little bit before we forget it about, the, uh, yeah, because this is the dog fest and people are interested in technology and so on. Uh, maybe you could also, um, uh, while Olga is thinking about a question, maybe uh, also tell us a little bit about the equipment, about your camera, uh, who accompanied you, you know, light, uh, sound, but also, uh, seems uh, it's it's a relatively dark film it, it looks like you didn't have big big lights with you and uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit what your decision was i mean this is a summer film you did you filmed it in the summer that you, uh, where, where the sun doesn't set uh, early uh, and yet it's a dark film uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about these decisions i mean it's, it's tough to be there in the summer with the mosquitoes we saw that uh, but it was a, it was it seems to have been a uh, decision to produce a film uh, that is relatively dark in the end, even though it's done in the summertime. Uh, maybe you can combine that with the question of equipment, and maybe Olga uh, has has a question uh, as well. Right, maybe can I can I just or, or? yeah, maybe yeah. Mm -hmm. First, first dance, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe we we go. Uh, uh, me. Yeah, okay, Lisbeth goes first, okay. Well, I don't know, I'm... <laughs> okay, I'll answer. Um, so the, the choice of filming in summer was also because I wanted to show... I, did, I, I have been to, uh, to Kasachi, even in the north, in, in winter, and it was very hard. The temperatures reached minus 45 uh, degrees Celsius, so it was very cold. It was beautiful. It's all white, all snow. It's it's really very beautiful. But I didn't want it to show this beautiful uh, winterland. It, it, it's a movie about climate change, and I wanted to see this abundance of water. Like I wanted also to add that it's a movie about climate change, but actually almost never somebody talks about it. So I really wanted to be, make it visible. And that's again also a choice of not doing something informative of the past, but really experiencing it so that was uh, the choice of, uh, of going in summer I, I i had this idea that i really wanted the viewer to feel like you could squeeze out like a sponge every image like we also worked with sometimes uh, uh water on the lens uh, for example so that that was a, a deliberate choice um then uh, i went uh, from belgium we left with three so it was me as a director then there was uh, one person who was both the producer and the sound person there. And then there was another, there was a cameraman. Um, these are two um, uh, colleagues that I've also worked with a lot in the, in, in the, in the past. So I knew if, if you go on an expedition, you need really to, pe to know people and you can do this together and you can count on them. Um, it's a fairly small team that we th that we were, but it's also because of these diff these difficulties, the, the, these logistic difficulties there. Um, for example, when we went on the hunting trip with the two brothers, um, we were a group always of three boats. So there's the two brothers who have their boat with uh, a camera and uh, the cameraman and the sound man in there. Then we have a boat um, with, with me and, and equipment. We always had to bring a lot of food, uh, tent equipment, but also big uh, tons of, of fuel for the boat uh, th that we needed. And if we would have had more people, then we would have needed more boats and everything would have exploded even more. So it was our choice to do it um, uh, uh, narrow uh, with a small team. Um, the sound guy, he um, he had a basic sound setup. He had a, a, a recorder, he had a pointed out microphone. Uh, he had these wireless microphones. And then we had like a, um, 
so that was that's more to capture the action and the, when people talk footsteps these things but then he also had another microphone that really captured the atmosphere because also during filming also of my my previous work i knew that that was something that i really wanted to work with it's about this in, in emerging into into the nature so there the sound can play a, a very big role so that was something we did and then the camera guy we had a camera it was a ari amira it's like a, it's a pretty good digital camera, but it's a documentary version. So where one person can operate this camera, he doesn't need uh, some somebody else. But it's a pr pretty good camera because I was also looking to film. I wanted to show the wonder of of this nature, the beauty of this nature, the sublime of the nature. It's not it's not per se like an a, a exotic view, but to to show the gloriness of of this nature. And I think we needed to have like a a good decent camera that made. Uh, beautiful images with that mm -hmm. so that's about the equipment uh, yeah. was there another that, part and I, I think uh, then i'd also li like to make a suggestion maybe olga ask a question and then elena ask a question then we uh open it up to the questions that have come out of the chat there are some questions and then we go back to our panel so uh this is this is uh totally interesting uh i could uh, i have so many questions i don't want to ask anymore because olga mm -hmm. and elena should have a chance to Yes, thank you. I actually have many questions and maybe a general one be, will be just um, how was it to make this film and how long did it take you? And I'm curious to know basically any detail, but now that I was listening to you, I came up with particular aspects which would interest me. My research is about the uh, history of food in the colonization of Siberia in the 17th and 18th century. And I was wondering, uh, what did you eat while you were there? And how was it different? Or maybe there was something you missed or something that you tried for the first time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the second question, a small aspect of it is, uh, do you feel more like participant or more as an observer, um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, all right. The food question. Uh, we ate a lot of fish and reindeer. Um, when we we made well, we filmed in in Yakutsk a bit, and then we went on a long exp uh, expedition before returning back to Yakutsk. First, we filmed uh, with a scientist. And uh, the first part, we were still in a town called uh, Batahaika. So we just had um, a place there where we could eat. It wasn't that, that special. But then when we went to our second place, we, we, we took a boat ride for six hours. And there we camped uh, uh, on the shores. And uh, the, the scientist was with us, but there was also a boatsman. And um, also this boatsman, he also, uh, they went to, while we were filming, they went to catch fish. And um, when we came back, we had uh, uh, mostly like a, a fish soup to eat. And it was uh, very delicious. I don't know exactly which uh, fish it was. When we communicated, they said riba. So uh, that's very <laughs> generic, I guess. Um, but so a lot of, during that expedition, it was uh, um, fish soup. Another nice element was that Semyon, the scientist, he had been to that place like a week before with another uh, film crew. And he, with that film crew, he, had, he still had quite some bread left over. So he hit that. And when we came back, it was like this very dark uh, brown black bread. When we came back, it was still good. And we, we finished <laughs> the bread from, from there. Um, we were, our, our Belgium team, we were a bit afraid of the water situation because they drink water from the river. And we were like, okay, shall we take this risk? We had some filters, but it took a very long time to filter the water. And then at a certain point, like the cookie says to us, guys, you know, you've been drinking water from the river already for a couple of days. So I think it's fine. So from that, from that moment on, when we were on the boats in the middle of the river, we filled our, 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 our um, bottles uh, with, with water from the river. Um, for the second part with, with, the, with the brothers, there was a, um, well, there was fish, we ate a lot of fish. Um, we ate the duck that was being, that is hunted in the film that we also ate. But for them also very important is, is reindeer. And when I was on a research trip there, it was during winter, they let us taste these uh, specialities, which had, which was quite special. Like one was, uh, a frozen reindeer uh, liver 
very dark in color. And when it was frozen, it was still okay uh, to eat. But after a while, it, it, it melted a bit. Uh, um, my assistant at that moment, she was vegetarian, but she already said in the beginning, like, look, we go there. Uh, this has nothing to do with this, uh, uh, how we treat cows and pigs and, and, and chicken here. So she, she ate it, but it was very strong. We also had reindeer tongue, which was also, I mean, I'm very happy that I tasted it, but it was a challenge. And they made a lot of uh, pastries with uh, reindeer meat in it. And uh, we also had this, um, uh, uh, but I think that's, they have this in the whole of Siberia, this, these very thin slices of uh, fish, frozen fish. You put it in a bit of uh, uh, salt. And so that's, that's what, we, what we ate here. When we went to the reindeer herders, when we ate with them, we were already on an expedition for quite a while. And there, there was a reindeer soup that they made like just boiled water and uh, they are quite isolated they can go get food but they're still quite isolated and with that soup i remember like oh when you had just a piece of onion you were already happy to have some vitamins in there um uh, yeah so that's that's what we ate but we always had locals that we worked with who are not like uh, professional caterers but they always made very they always took very good care of us so then they always did their best and 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 we we had enough food yeah that was uh, nice interesting question and I, that's, I, 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 yeah. excuse me no no i just said interesting question and ah. fascinating answer and uh Maybe Elena and can... And second question, oh, yeah. what? Yeah. Oh, there was a second part of the question. The second part was about you being a participant or rather an observer, but I think it's already getting sort of obvious that, of course, you were a participant, but you're, of course, the one with, who was watching it at, uh, as an outsider. Yeah. So how, how, what was the proportion? Well, I, I always see myself kind of like a coach of a team because you work so close that people it's a docu fiction it's hybrid so they they act in a way but they are not professional actors and that's also not what i expect them to be so if they do some if they if they really are in a scene it must be that they believe in it and that that they understand everything and that we're on the same line like sometimes in advance i had a lot of propositions like we can go do this we can go do that but they always had the possibility to say like no that's that's not how we would do it or that's not something i would say roman the older brother he said that a couple of times that's not why i was like okay then we look together so what could you say because that's the idea behind it you know and then we we look together so i see it more like as a coach who has a vision who has a plan but then together with these uh, players actually uh, we make the whole uh, project, yeah. So, okay. Elena, I'm sure you have a question too, and then we move to the uh, other audience. Um, yeah, so I have a question. Actually, I have several questions. I'm just thinking what should be not a very long question, maybe. You know, actually, I was intrigued by one of the last remaining scenes in the film about these tunnels, you know, that they went to the Simeon scientist went into some tunnel. And I was trying to understand what was there, like, what was the tunnel? Uh, because it wasn't clear, and then he start, um, you know, tasting some almost like a meat of a, of a mom of a mammoth or something like that. But the tunnel itself looked like some sort of maybe abandoned abandoned Soviet structure. Like, can you just tell me a little bit more? Like, I know <laughs> I'm just intrigued by that uh, particular scene. What was there actually in those tunnels? Okay, the the fictionalization it's 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 built up gradually. In the beginning, there's like these little fictionalizations. Uh, uh, halfway, there's some more, and then at the end, we really go full in. And uh, to both Kim and Samyon, um, uh, we talk we thought about it as a sort of a, a permafrost dream. At the end, um, we we also follow Samyon, who who gets very close to uh, finding a mammoth. We we follow him in, and then what happens afterwards? It's it's dream. There's a, a dream logic. So that was very uh, fictionalized in where we we found these tunnels. That there are separated ele elements that got combined uh, together. Uh, for example, the tunnel specifically, it's um, it's a permafrost museum. And you can go down and down, and that's where these tunnels are. And they are um, making uh, experiments on how different things react in permafrost. 
trust or uh, but we used it as a, um, a setting for the film you know it's, it's, it's just a setting um, uh, when he eats uh, the meat what, what you see it's based on uh, something that he did in, in the past well he, he tasted um, Samyon, he went, in the movie he tells that he found this carcass uh, in the past, that he found the carcass and that it was very fresh and that the, the carcass still had liquid blood uh, coming out. So he found this and he was there uh, right with as close as you, a human being can get to a mammoth in these days. And that's when he, he tasted the mammoth. It's a known story that he did. So he, he, had, he saw this meat that still looked so fresh it was red meat, you know, it wasn't old. And well, it was old, but it didn't look like that. So, so he had a little taste of it. And for me, the meaning of that, um, we talked about it, that you also see it in, the, in other uh, documentaries, but I didn't want to sensationalize it like, oh, look at how crazy th this is. But for me, it was a, a very beautiful thing because you have this one human being, uh, Semyon, who, who, who loves these mammoths and who, who misses who misses the mammoth like he, he wants to bring them back and at that moment he becomes the only human being that has been so close to to, to this animal and that's what I wanted to per portray with that shot like I think at the end we already spoke also about the boy who is in the artificial landscape all these different shots had like a, a symbolic or a poetic meaning and they, they are combined in, in what we called uh, a permafrost dream okay so I think uh, Jan uh, we are ready to, to uh, get some questions from the yes. internet Yes, we have uh, questions from the viewers, and uh, the first one goes to Lisbeth, and uh, someone goes by the name of Guest, said that she was very touched by the legend of Holgut, the Mamas, which opens your film, and she is curious, how did you learn about it? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, because uh, uh, like Olga already said, um, uh, the main language of the film is uh, Saka, Yakutian. Um, but the legend in the beginning of the movie, it's, it's not Yakutian, it's uh, Yukagir. And it's also, yeah, well, Yukagir are people who live uh, all up north in uh, Yakutia. They're uh, um, also very much related to the uh, reindeer, um, reindeer herding. And uh, there's, there's not that, uh, that many people uh, uh, still living up there. And also the language, uh, it's, uh, it's only, it was less than, less than 50 people still speak this language. And I had uh, the privilege to meet a man uh, who, who knew a lot about this culture. And he, he, he uh, told me the, the, the story of Holgut. And uh, uh, for me, like one of the things that I wanted to explore in the movie was this idea of, of myths. Is it something in the past or is it something that keeps evolving? Because in that myth, you have Holgut, the, the mammoth, but you also have, a ma it's actually influenced by uh, Christian mythology because it's, it's, it's a combination of the story about this mammoth and uh, uh, the, the flood and Noah building his ark, but then it's transported to, to, to Yakutia and to their culture, so he makes a, a raft. So I, 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 I was immediately fascinated by this uh, mythology. And also the line of, of the, the myths in the movie is, in, that, in this movie we see, okay, the, the mammoth gets lost and the rest of the, the, the mythology is, is people trying to to find him again. So that's why we started with it. And that's, I also really wanted to have the idea of also a language going extinct, maybe be revived, let's hope so, but that it's not just these animals, that it's things coming and going, this uh, creation of uh, past, and pre uh, past, present and future in the same moment. I also found that in that one story. There's another question uh, also for Elisabeth uh, once again. And this is uh, Edda writes us uh, how impressed she was by your poetic approach in the film uh, to a subject that is actually also scientific. How did it came about and uh, was that clear from the beginning or did that evolve? Um, is it specifically about cloning or just in general maybe? Yeah, yeah the balance between your poetic approach and the subject being essentially scientific. Ah, okay. Um, well, it, 
when I was reading about the, uh, uh, the, the cloning part and also about this extinction, uh, extinction, de extinction, uh, I saw for me it was it, it was like poetry. I, I am also in my previous works, I am very much fascinated about to, to see a poetic layer in there. It's, it's just like science is also, it's, it's, if you think about um, the ethical parts or what they are really doing, it, it, it this poetry. I mean, we if we talk about the extinction, it's it's bringing back um, uh, bringing back these animals from the dead. So for, for me, there there it's just. I think also science and, and the scientific world. Uh, it's sometimes a world difficult to enter and to understand and to see. And I, I would like to see myself as. A person who is in between scientists and and and, a, and an audience to kind of bring it in a certain way, and then I think looking at it as with a poetic view is is, is, is a good way to to do that. Yeah. Um, there is actually also a question for Olga. Is um, uh, we see only a fraction of the lives of the two boys, and um, uh, our audience wonders. Uh, as you know the country well, how is the life for the youth over there, Olga? What should, should I need to know? It's a good question because, as I have already said, I have never been to the north, but I can only judge from uh, anthropological works which I have read or so. And uh, actually, as I have also written about the film, uh, and Elizabeth can correct me there, that um, a lot of people migrate to cities to find some job and uh, they don't lead this traditional lifestyle. And I think uh, what we saw in the first part about the two brothers, it's, uh, mm, well, I, I hope it's not a rarity, but it's uh, it can be look very different for the people living up in the north. There are also cities, well, not very far in the north, but maybe in the middle uh, of Russia and uh, life does not look that different as in other European cities, maybe with an, um, just um, the difference that the cities are much smaller and the infrastructure is not that developed. But um, I think um, Elizabeth can <laughs> tell more about uh, the people she met in the landscapes which we saw in the films. But my answer would probably be that it is just the part of that reality of Siberia, or better say, the northern part of Siberia. And uh, a big part would be also urban life with uh, people going to jobs and earning money and not hunting reindeer. And of course, we have uh, more questions for Lisbeth. And um, this is Marli who writes us. Uh, and suggest that you answer Elizabeth in a poetic way of thinking. She asked Elizabeth, do you think that man can influence nature in a good way? Can man also inscribe things in nature? Uh, yes, I think um, man can. This is just my personal <laughs> view. I think uh, man can and I think we have reached to this point that the influence of of man is everywhere, especially also due to uh, climate change now, it's, it's literally everywhere. And it would be nice to think of the world as a wild place or, but it's, it's, it's not anymore. And if we want best for nature, for fauna, flora, uh, I think we should uh, inter well, interfere um, where the levels are. I, I cannot say in which, in which extent go, but I think um, we should see that the, the actions we do have an influence on nature, whether we want it or not, and it becomes more and more clearer. It's, 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 it's in, in Yakutia, you have, uh, well, in Siberia, in the north, you have this abundance of water. On the other hand, you have all these wildfires in Australia and, and in California. So it's, it's, it's everywhere. And I think it's our, our job to interfere if we want uh, animals and, and, and fauna to survive. I think it's just the reality that we live in now, and I can, I can close my eyes and think of a beautiful wild world, but if we are in, in reality, I think we should try our best to help. And there are beautiful examples, like you already said that my, my, my first movie was in the Redwoods. And for example, it's a small example, but uh, controlled fires 
uh, is a great way of, 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 of making sure that it, an interference of humankind. So they, they, they make these fires so that um, they're controlled and the fires are contained so that after 20 years of buildup, otherwise there's not a huge fire. So it's these little things that I think we should do. And maybe also, of course, a zoo or, or, or nature areas, uh, uh, nature parks, for example, it's not this idea of wild, but I think it's, it's the best way of, 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 of preserving nature or even trying to help combat nature in, in, in certain places. Maybe I could ask a question that goes first to uh, Elena, uh, because we heard from you, Lisbeth, uh, uh, that you know, this is all Judeo-Christian myth in part that was then adopted and paganized, if you will, and uh, got a new life. Uh, and I, I'd like to get a little bit more into the minds of the people. Uh, what role does uh, religion play, cosmology? We saw all these little drawings that were re really creation myths. Uh, and so maybe... Uh, I'd like to, to ask you in a way so that everybody can respond, but first perhaps Elena, who has done uh, many interviews with people in Siberia and has lived with them in part. Uh, so the first question would be about, you know, what, what role does religion play uh, in, in, in Siberia with these people? But then I'm also intrigued by the fact that, I mean, uh, Elena was in that area at an earlier point. Now everybody in the world is talking about permafrost. To what extent is this a topic uh, today? In 2018, when Lisbeth was there, uh, people actually talking about that. Maybe you can, all of you, give us a little bit, uh, get into the mind of the people, what their concerns are, uh, um, both in terms of you know the, the more broad and religious and philosophical questions, but also the concrete fears they have. Maybe uh, Elena can start, and then Lisbeth and Olga. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so Lisbeth, I already answered a little bit. So the beginning of, of the film, she takes this myth from the Judeo-Christian tradition, right? So the saving the animals from the flood. But then she adds something to it, right? So, so uh, the mammoth couldn't get on because he was too big. And then, you know, that's how he kind of fell through the cracks and disappears. But in the end of the film, there is actually another myth that the boy tells that the he, boys is, is involved in the myth taking right now. So he, myth making. So the, the big mammoth is emerging from the ground and he leaves a huge hole in the ground. And so a man and a boy or father and son falls into that hole, right? So, and that sounds like a new myth just emerged that he makes this new myth. And so that sounds a little bit kind of a dark, not very Christian maybe. Um, the tradition that you know, this indigenous peoples of Yakutia, there's several, and Lisbeth mentioned several already, like the Yakagirs, there's Yakuts, there's Ivanks of the North. They're actually known for practicing shamanism. Um, and apparently there is still quite a, some, you know, still there are some people who are shamans there. So the tradition is a little bit still alive. Um, and I was actually wondering if Lisbeth came across, I mean, they must be talking about uh, a lot of practices that are still kind of conveying some of the cosmology, right? So that consists of several, like, like I, I believe it's nine levels. The, the world consists of nine levels. And so every being has their own layer or own level that where they actually occupy in that cosmology. And so the animals live there and the humans live here and mammals probably live somewhere else at the, at the kind of a ground level of the existence. And so I was just wondering, actually, Lisbeth, if you came across some of those kind of uh, experiences or practices that they still practice very much, I, I think, in, in the North. Have you? Well, I haven't. Um, uh, I cannot talk about gen uh, general Yakutian culture, but the, the, the encounters that I had and the people that I worked with, they and, and you also see it a bit in, in, in the film when the, when the older brother says, uh, before they go uh, on their trip, like, okay, we, we give a, a, an offering to, to the gods. And these things were very, very present. Every time we took a boat, we offered something to the, um, to the river, for example. So it's, 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 it's a sort of an animism that you, that, you, that you believe that every um, natural uh, being or phenomenon, like also the river is a spirit. The river is Yana, it, 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 it's a spirit. So you, you offer to it and it was very much incorporated in their daily lives. For example, Roman, he would, he would, he was riding his boat and 
he would light a cigarette and he would give one to the river or he would have something to eat and he would give something to eat just while, while he's driving. So it was, it was uh, very much uh, in their, um, in their day to day life uh, with Semyon also, like it's true that uh, mammoths, they live underground um, in, in, in these different levels. I don't know exactly which level, but it's, it's, it's underground. And when they, uh, as, as an honoring to um, when, when humans take something out, they always give something back. And it can be beads, it can be food, it can be cigarettes, it can be, it can be drinks, you know, they always give something back. And so that was still very much um, incorporated. Like they have their, their uh, jobs, their, their tasks and their, their modern jobs, you know, but still that is in, in, in the back of their minds, yeah. I Maybe I can just add to the religious question, if I may, because I found it really fascinating and I celebrated this moment when uh, there is the scene of the offering to the spirit of the moon. And uh, it's amazing that there have been efforts to Christianize Siberia for now about um, 400 years uh, at least, right? And they, uh, as we see, they did not completely succeed. And it's a very beautiful um, um, perseverance or remaining of these uh, cosmologies and uh, um, still there are also the mixtures as, uh, as already Bill mentioned about this whole good myth and I think also back in times the travelers uh, or ethnographers in the 18th century they already found some um, mixtures of these ideas from Christianity and local religions and uh, yeah this mixture I find really beautiful in the film and in general in Siberian cultures. Well, we have uh, basically reached the end of our one hour discussion, but I'd like to ask you one final question uh, that you, if you feel like it could, should answer. I'm, I'm wondering if you have one wish for Yakusha, uh, what would it be? Where should it be heading uh, in the future? Oh, that's that's difficult for me to uh, to say. Um, I wish. I wish like it's it's also what what you just said now with this this these beliefs and this um, like I to to preserve like to preserve what they have like the, the way that they look at the world. Um, it's uh, the, the wilderness in itself, but also to th this look at the world. It is, if, if you're there for a long time and you look at the landscape, it becomes magical. It's beautiful already out of itself. It's, but that the, this 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 mythical look at at the at, at the landscape. I, I, I wish for them to preserve as as as, as well as possible uh, this um, look at the world. Yeah. Olga or Elena, do you want to add something? Yes, um, you know, Yakutia is a special place, not only, not only for the landscapes, but also for the cultures, for the indigenous cultures. They're very strong there. You know, they haven't really lost them. And for the indigenous governance, this is the only region in Russia that have actually ethnographic environmental impact assessment implemented. So when they have a project like constructing a pipeline, like in theory, they still need to ask the local indigenous people. So the bottom line, the indigenous cultures are still very strong there. So I, my wish is that they keep it and not to surrender to this kind of movement of, you know, mineral explorations, pipelines and all those things. So just keep what you have, your true treasure is this culture. You know. yeah. Probably the same would be for me <laughs> as well. Although, yes, there are, um, there is this northern way, right, due to the melting of the uh, Arctic ice and uh, the infrastructure can change probably and new ways appear, but still I really wish that all these cultures preserve and maybe that we can, or not maybe, I'm sure we can learn a great deal of this uh, fine balance that is implicit in their cultures between humans and nature and taking from the nature means that you need to give something back to it an offering or something else. Lisbeth, Elena and Olga, I thought this was a wonderful discussion. I cannot thank you enough for, uh, well, uh, Olga, staying up that late at three o'clock at night and 
all of you uh, for uh, enlightening us in, in, a, in a very special way. I think this is a, has been a very special discussion and it brought together so many diverse things uh, from frozen reindeer liver to the end of the world uh, apocalypse and the uh, founding of the earth. And uh, so I think that uh, the reason why it brought so many things together and these discussions went in so many different and fascinating and, and uh, uh, haunting and at the same time beautiful directions is the film itself. And that has triggered uh, and will trigger uh, many provocations uh, and, and uh, in, in the future. So just uh, thank you so much to the three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Christo. Thank you.